Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ARA's Webinar Wednesday program. I'm Jerry DiMaggio. I'll be serving as moderator for today's webinar, which is entitled Prediction and Design for Extreme Load Events Using Digital Twins. Next slide, please. I'd like to first uh, review a few housekeeping items with you in the next three slides. First of all, if you're experiencing an issue with sound and you're using your computer speakers, disconnect your computer speaker connection and please dial in using your phone. In the event that you're experiencing another issue, please use the chat button to send a message to the host. Next slide, please. Throughout the entire program, we encourage you to ask questions, and those will be addressed at the conclusion of today's technical program. If you have questions, and please listen carefully to this direction, please click on the Q&A button and send your question, and this can be sent during the entire technical program, to both the host and the panelist, and we'll address these in the Q&A session, which is about 15 minutes directly after the technical presentation. Next slide, please. Finally, with regard to housekeeping, to view the presentation in full screen mode, at the top of your webinar settings, click on the down arrow, highlight view, and then choose fit the viewer. Now it's my pleasure, next slide please, now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. First, as a reminder, also I will be, uh, we will be, you will be receiving, pardon me, a one hour PDH certificate if you, if you attend the entire one hour program today. So our presenter today is Mr. Robert Lundford. And Robert is a senior engineer and a team leader at ARA, as all of our presenters are. He's been uh, a key participant in the professional, the principal investigator lead in terms of engineer and security professionals in providing assessments, analysis, design, and retrofitting for blast penetration, ballistic progressive collapse, vehicle barrier impact, and other extreme loading conditions for numerous facilities and structures worldwide. Robert specializes in detailed finite element modeling and analysis. Predictions from his analysis are conducted prior to testing as as compared with testing results that have already been accomplished. Before joining ARA, Robert spent time researching impact dynamics for NASA's Langley Research Center and blast effects for the Corps of Engineers. He holds a BS and an MS degree in mechanical engineering from very prominent universities. With that introduction, I'd like to turn today's program over to Robert. All right, thank you, Jerry. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, digital twins uh, uh, and a specific application of digital twins. Uh, so I'm going to give a brief uh, overview of uh, digital twins in general and then say a little bit about the um, digital twin development process. And then I'm going to get into some more some details on, on the development and use in a couple of case studies, um, a metal panel breach study and a concrete cavity wall study. Um, and then I uh, have a couple of uh, quick examples of additional digital twins and then some concluding remarks. So um, what is a digital twin? Um, I have a brief um, definition here that's uh, pretty good. Um, it says a digital twin is a data-driven virtual model that replicates a complex real-world physical entity. And so a digital twin can represent a wide variety of, uh, of things or entities. Um, got a few listed here, such as products, buildings, even uh, whole cities, um, also systems or processes, um, and events or experiences. Um, and this category is what I'm going to be focusing on um, today, uh, specifically one-time extreme load environments, 
uh, which could include blast, shock, impact, or penetration. <clears throat> and so the, the digital twin concept has been uh, around for quite a while. Um, NASA was an early pioneer in this area. Uh, they used uh, virtual models of their early spaceships to help improve performance. Um, but now the, the concept has been rapidly uh, evolving over the last uh, several years, uh, mainly due to uh, vast amounts of uh, available data from real-world entities. Also, advances in understanding in the usefulness of an application of this data and a monumental increase in computer power and capacity um, has enabled uh, more complex and detailed um, digital twin models. So typically the primary focus or function of digital twins are to improve performance of physical entities in areas such as function, cost, um, and also uh, timing and schedule as far as uh, areas of uh, manufacturer, life cycle, um, also that are used to improve longevity, um, and also inform decision making with respect to various physical entities um, as far as life cycle and uh, resource allocation. Uh, so historically, the focus of digital twins has been primarily on um, entities that are already in place, um, taking uh, measurements to monitor and evaluate what is currently happening and using these to predict um, what might happen in the future um, using the digital model. Um, and, and also informed decision making for potential changes or modifications that need to be made uh, as the life uh, of the entity uh, progresses. So the use of digital twins in the areas of uh, architecture and design is uh, somewhat in its infancy, um, but uh, looking forward, the, the future uh, indicates that there could be significant advances in design um, using digital twin, twins for the, these areas. So, and I'm going to be focusing on um, the area of design optimization. Um, or physical structural systems, um, and also again specific to single case extreme load events. <laughs> and so now move on to a little bit about the development process for uh, digital twin for prediction and design. So in, in general, a, a digital model um, can be defined to you know look like just about anything um, and get just about any results you want. Uh, and these results don't necessarily have to represent the real world. Um, so I've got a quick example here. Um, so this is a, um, a window frame. This is the 2D section of a window frame, the window loading it in, in this direction. So this model has, again, a two-dimensional slice. And it predicted um, a 1,200 pound per inch capacity. So if we expanded, when we expanded this model um, into a three-dimensional space to include you know, the bolt geometry, the hole geometry, um, and the bolt spacing accounted for, um, we see that this model suggests only uh, 480 pound per inch capacity. And this, in this particular model, was due to shearing through the frame down here. And so we see that these um, are, you know, obviously different results. And uh, in this case, we expect the 3D model to more, more closely represent the real world. <clears throat> and so, to effectively um, develop an effective digital twin care must be taken to ensure that it actually represents the real world. Um, now, we can't always validate with data a model of an entire complex entity or system. But we can 
break it down and validate individual components um, and also the modeling and analysis approach used uh, to develop this. So we can break it down into these parts and validate them individually. Um, and also the, the level of detail in the digital twin model um, should be based on an understanding of the entity um, and also the purpose or, or end goal. Um, because if we include too much detail, it can uh, reduce efficiency without uh, any benefit um, because of uh, extended uh, you know, development time of the model or uh, run time for the analysis of the model. Um, and also, if we have too little detail, it can reduce the accuracy. Uh, so there's got to, there's a balance there, and it takes a little level of understanding um, to make sure we uh, we get the right balance. <clears throat> for, for now, so now I'm going to talk about um, get into the case studies where we get in a little more detail. So this one. Um, First case study is the, the breaching of a metal panel with a small explosive uh, device. And so here I've listed some of the goals of this digital twin um, that we're developing. So the goal is to be able to predict the blast breach distance. Um, so what distance does charge have to be to breach this panel? And to, to do this, we will need to replicate the blast test results. Um, without prior knowledge of the test results. Um, and for that, we have to do two things, predict the blast loading uh, on the panel and predict the metal panel response to this complex blast loading. And then after we did this, we were able to compare analysis predictions to the test results. And the ultimate goal is to um, be able to evaluate various metal panel types without costly and time-consuming testing. Um, and over here, this, on the right, this is just a picture of the test setup that we were trying to replicate. And so our process for developing this digital twin uh, was first we did a, a literature review uh, to uh, get data we needed to develop the uh, uh, digital model of the material properties. Um, and then we did some finite element analysis uh, to validate those material, uh, digital material models. Um, and we did that using uh, LS Dyna. And throughout uh, these uh, examples, we're, we're using finite element models as, a, uh, as the digital twin. Uh, and so well, we also will have to predict the blast load, um, develop the model of the full test, um, and then do a model comparison. So for the literature review, um, you know, we, we researched uh, what we could find on test data for, for this, the material the panels were made out of. Um, and we, we were looking for particular um, properties uh, because we were expecting uh, on the based on the test, the high load gradient across the panel and high strain rate and also various failure mechanisms. I mean, usually a lot of testing and research is required to determine all the variables needed to uh, develop a material model in the digital space. Um, but we were able to leverage previous testing and research uh, through a, a literature review and finding uh, testing that was done um, on similar materials um, and also uh, material model input. And on the right there is an example of a couple of, uh, couple of examples of what we found. Um, and so uh, we uh, used this data and evaluated two different material models um, for use in LS Dyna. And those were Johnson Cook and uh, piecewise linear plasticity. Um, and both of these have uh, uh, include properties that we thought were important for this case. Um, 
is, is listed here. Um, uh, most importantly, was being able to account for strain rate effects. Um, but and they they each had uh, a little bit different uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, and so we looked at them using um, Clint Hopkins bar uh, data, which is what we were provided with, or what we found in the literature, which is typical data um, for a high strain rate in a material specimen. Um, and so the, the test specimen is here between these two bars, and then a striker bar is impacted on one bar, and then data is taken from the strain gauges, um, and and uh, and it's determined what the properties are um, based on that, and the the they look at different velocities of impact to look at the properties at different strain rates. So that's the data that we had um, for this material, and so to validate our material model, um, we actually um, develop a um, model of that with Hopkins bar test. And on the right is the portion of that model um, just to represent that actual test um, made out of solid elements um, with contact surfaces, obviously. And um, anyway, and we uh, apply the velocity just like in the test so we could compare the material um, as they were defined in the uh, digital space and to to make sure that uh, that they actually represented the real world, and so this shows the comparison. Uh, um, the graph on the right there, the uh, dashed lines are the test data. The other two lines are um, what we got from our analysis of the uh, split Hopkins bar test. Um, they both compared fairly well to the test data um, for the strain rate that we looked at. Um, and so we, we looked at the material properties again, um, and we chose the Johnson Cook because it was more widely used and it had a more advanced failure and, and damage uh, ability. So that's what we went with. So the next step was we had to determine um, or predict the blast loads that were going to be on the panel at the different uh, uh, distances that we were looking at. Um, and so we used a uh, code called Shamrock, which is a high fidelity uh, multi physics code that has years of validation um, with explosive tests. Um, and in the test, the charge was, was molded as a sphere and a um, detonator was inserted. And so we went ahead and modeled that detail with the detonator just in case uh, that affected the uh, loading enough to uh, make a difference. And this just shows some examples of the uh, pressure contours uh, from that load prediction. So on the left, that's the elevation section through the middle of the panel, and on the right, the plan view with the square being the, the panel that we were, we were loading um, and the contour colors are the various levels of, of pressure and this is um, at the one and a half inch approach distance at 0.1 millisecond and this is farther out in time at 0.5 milliseconds you can see it has, has progressed and you can see there's a lot of there's some complicated um, loading going on um, so it wasn't a, a really simple load. And so we were able to take the loads generated here and apply them to a, to a model that we developed. So I'm going to talk about now. So this is the model, or one of the models. We actually um, did this first as a, a detailed model with, uh, this is just a quarter symmetry, putting symmetry uh, have symmetry along the edges because it was a perfectly square 
um, from experience, we figured that would be uh, appropriate. Um, and so with this model, we included all the details from the test, including the bolts, and we pre-stressed the bolts. Um, and we had the panel, we had the um, clapping flange on top of the panel. Uh, we also, as a comparison, did a more a simplified model um, with just constraints around the bolt hole uh, to represent the bolt uh, to see if we could get uh, reasonable results with that um, and get the analysis uh, done quicker uh, because we were going to have to run multiple analyses at different uh, distances to check for the uh, what the breach distance was. And so this is a comparison of those two cases, the no bolt there on the top with the flexion and the bolt on the bottom, um, and then uh, a displacement graph there on the right. As you can see, they can both uh, got very similar results, um, and so we chose to use the analysis without bolts because it was a simpler model and significantly less runtime. So we also looked at an alternate blast loading prediction uh, method using uh, ALE elements in LS Dyna, and they're just another specialized element that we can use to uh, model the air and the explosive explicitly. And so the diagram on the right there shows our air volume surrounding the, uh, the panel um, model. Um, and so this is just uh, showing some of the results from from that prediction um, with the pressure contours at different times at 0 0.01 millisecond and you know so on as the blast impact panel. So we took uh, re recorded readings from the the locations there on the right and compared them with the with this ALE method and the Shamrock method. Um, so this is showing that comparison to so the panel center and then uh, 10 inches from the center. So the Shamrock is in the green. Um, the, uh, the black is uh, yeah the black is the uh, ALE method. We also did some calculations using uh, kinery bull mash equations, which is red um, pressure contours. And that those equations were developed uh, based on test uh, test data. Just as it's, you plug in the, the charge and the the distance, and you um, you can get the pressure history. Um, these other lines are the impulse, which are just basically the areas under the, the curves for the different uh, different loop cases. Uh, as you can see, uh, the shamrock uh, typically has a higher uh, peak. Um, and if you get farther away over here, the earlier time of arrival. And then we look at the corner, similar um, similar effects going on there. And so these are kind of a summary of the results. Once we did the analysis, we compared it with the test um, for, and to see what approach distances we got breach. And as you can see, uh, we got pretty good with the shamrock load. We predicted the breach at the same approach distances and got similar size holes. We didn't do quite as good with the ALE results, but we did uh, predict the breach um, at the uh, 1.5 inch distance that, that the test saw. Um, and so we felt like that this was a pretty good um, uh, model or a pretty good twin. Again, here's an example showing um, one of the uh, the damage for one of the cases at 1.5 inch. Uh, distance for the, the charge. You see we have a similar sized hole in the panel um, and in our model. And so uh, for this uh, 
case study, our conclusions are that you know the Shamrock is very well um, at predicting the approach distances. Um, the ALE did okay, but uh, didn't quite um, get it all right. Um, so we we uh, figured that the differences um, could be because um, you know we had limited test data um, and it was only or for the material and it was only um, generic data. We didn't have data for the exact panel that were tested. Um, and also the um, FEA, we had an idealized, perfectly symmetric charge. And we, based on some of the test results we saw, we think there's potential for asymmetry in the test um, based on the detonator plate. Um, and also, the Shamrock uh, was a multiple step process that took you know, we had to do two independent analyses, and the ALE, even though it got didn't quite get as uh, good a result, um, it was just a single step process. And we think there could be some improvement there um, to make it uh, a more efficient process with just that single step. But overall, we thought it was an effective digital twin, and again, we could um, have some improvement. And so, some recommended improvements that we had. Um, additional material tests for the actual panel material, um, looking at the mesh uh, size and arrangements in the model more closely, um, also just developing additional um, glass loads for additional charge weight and approach distances, because with the Shamrock, you have to do those analysis, um, an analysis for each charge weight and each standoff. Um, also, Looking at refining the ALE so we could potentially um, use that for the loading and just have a one uh, step process and additional blast testing to get more data so we could uh, uh, validate our, our model better. So, anyway, that was, that's uh, case study one. So, case study two um, was the concrete cavity wall that we looked at, um, and we wanted to predict wall response to a large explosive charge. And again, the similar um, process, we wanted to replicate the blast test without prior knowledge of the test results. So there was a test conducted, um, but we were only given pre-test information. Um, and again, we needed to predict the blast load and predict the wall response, and then compare um, predictions the test results. And the ultimate goal, again, was to be able to evaluate wall optimization um, without additional testing um, that's costly and, and time consuming. So our uh, <clears throat> development process, again, uh, similar to the previous one, um, but, but first we, we looked at some uncertainties in the blast loading um, and otherwise, which were many. Um, and then you know, we evaluated our pretest information, which was the drawings and photos, and there were some test data for some of the materials used in the construction. Um, then again, we developed our finite element model um, using LS Dyna, um, and then we did some material validation um, using that test data that we had, and also we had to do the blast load prediction. And then finally, compare with the test results again. <clears throat> so just quickly, you can look up, uh, over this. And there's several uncertainties in uh, predicting uh, a blast test uh, from the gauges, calibration. Um, we don't know for sure the level of detonation of the explosive. Um, the equation of state for the explosive materials that were used in the uh, material model, um, you know, the uniformity of the explosive materials, um, reaction of the material of the explosive, and material properties for the structure that, um, can be uncertain. Anyway, there's many, many uncertainties we had to keep in mind um, as we went through this process. So we looked at the blast test setup. Um, <clears throat> so the wall was a 
um, a bit of concrete. Uh, it was built up of these Alaska barriers um, with a cavity that was filled with sand. And the bottom, what the foundation was uh, a concrete, what we call the U-boat that encapsulated the, um, the Alaska barriers. It was built up of 24 of these. Alaska Barriers um, had a cast on the top and sides to hold all the stuff together. Um, it also had, I'm not showing here, some cables running in between, back and forth between the two walls to kind of hold it stable that way as well. Um, the explosive charge was a large charge, and it was complicated because it had uh, three different boosters, uh, uh, and then handful field box. Um, so that was a complication. Um, the test had many different gauges, um, free field pressure gauges, um, and then wall pressure gauges, accelerometer, strain gauges, and hammer varietal gauges. Um, so using all that information, we, we constructed a, uh, a model trying to capture all the um, Detailed geometry uh, on the right is kind of a section through our our model showing that you know we included all the basic parts um, in the middle using that drawing and on the, the far right is the, uh, the actual test structure and this is the full model um, showing all the the panel segments again it's made up of these individual segments um, divided by these vertical line. Um, down here on the lower right is the rebar that's um, encased in the concrete. We modeled the rebar ex explicitly. Um, the concrete was solid elements. The rebar was um, line elements. Um, and then we had SPH elements and table elements. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. Um, greatly. So we had to, um, we had, as I said before, we had material data um, or test data on the material used for construction. So over on the right, we have uh, the concrete testing data, which was just unconfined compressive strength test. Um, they had a number of tests. So they, they did it at two different cores. They initially um, did the uh, the last the barriers, and then they stacked them and uh, poured the U-boat and the cap. And it ended up that these two uh, pours were a different strength. Um, and so we used uh, you know, we used the average strength from this data for our material model, and we used the model mat concrete damage, which is a widely used model for concrete in LS China. Um, and again, we used the average material, 8100 PSI uh, for the Alaska barriers, and 5100 PSI uh, for the, the rest of the concrete. Um, and also this material model, um, it, can, it can show the damage, um, but when the elements get extremely damaged, they, they stretch out. And so we added some um, erosion to delete the highly deformed elements. Um, because when they get stretched and highly deformed, that can cause um, extended run times and instability in the analysis. Um, we also validated the, um, or yeah, did use the data for the uh, rebar and table uh, to, uh, to develop our material properties. And again, using the average from the test data for both of those, as shown here on the right. Um, and we used uh, you know, the material models shown there, elastic slides, linear plasticity, just a linear elastic plastic material. And for the table parts, we used a table element that only allows um, tensile load and, uh, and a breaking strain. Um, and for the sand, there was the fill, there was minimal information provided. Um, and so we did some research and we found a test report 
that uh, looked at various spans that we found um, one was similar to what was described, and so we used data from that to develop our material model for the sand field um, using the uh, material model that's soil and foam, and uh, using SPH elements. So SPH elements are just a special type of elements represented here with these little balls. Um, they can just kind of stick to each other or come apart and kind of move uh, like sand. And so we built a model to represent the triaxial testing that we found in the report, which is the cylinder, um, the sand, encapsulated mythologic membrane, and you apply um, pressures uh, to the cylinder and, and look at the response to the strength. Uh, and so we, we put proper, the properties into our uh, material model and did the analysis and compared it to the test data. And the test data is represented with this uh, curve bit line. And then our, our analysis is represented with these uh, different color dots. And you can see that uh, our analysis follows the test fairly closely um, uh, for the strength envelope calculation. So we figured that was a pretty good representation. Um, then we also had to, again, uh, do the load prediction. Um, and just briefly, this is an image showing the pressure histories we did uh, using Shamrock again to predict the, the load and uh, just the pressure contours on the wall and the ground. And so we applied these pressures to the wall um, in our analysis and, and got a response, and then we compared that to the test results. And this shows a comparison just with the, the pressure data. So the, uh, the blue line is our predictions, and the black is what we got from the pressure gauges um, on a couple of locations in the, on the front of the wall. As a comparison, you can see that our, our predictions at these locations um, was considerably higher for the peak pressure um, and also the impulse, and we had earlier times of arrival. Um, we, all, we also predicted lower lows on the back of the wall, a little different. So with these higher pressures, um, we, we did a little more investigation, and we were looking at the, the crater that was formed in the test. And on the right there, um, this is measurement of the crater that was predicted. It's 33 feet wide and 5.4 feet deep. Um, and then we looked at um, craters from other tests, and we noticed that um, over here on the, the left bottom, this is the measurement from a test with a, of a charge a third the size um, at what we figured was a similar condition, um, and it got a crater, made a crater the same or similar size. Um, as what we saw in, in this test was should have been three times bigger um, as far as the explosive. And so from this, we, we considered it was possible that the explosive in this wall test didn't completely detonate. So that, that could be a difference in our, in our results. So a comparison with the, um, the wall response is shown here. Um, you can see there's, uh, in the, this is the test results, and this is our, our model underneath. Um, similar damage patterns, um, although our, our model did show a more uh, extreme damage. Um, these walls, um, on this image at the bottom here, these wall segments were continuing to move in our analysis, and we expected them to um, fall over. So um, there's a little more um, extreme response in our analysis. So we, uh, you know, we figured that uh, that was caused by the higher loads that we were seeing when comparing the, the pressure data. So this one, there's a little bit more work to do to, to make sure it's uh, you know, an effective uh, digital twin, to make sure we understand the test data better. But um, in general, without seeing the test results, um, we, we feel like we, we 
did a pretty good job at uh, predicting uh, predicting what would happen to this. Um, and so, just a couple more, a couple of little examples briefly. This was another wall test um, that we did analysis previous to to the test results, and you can see um, in the images that we got similar damage. Um, and again, with this uh, with this model, it allowed design optimization um, without um, having to you know, construct. Uh, a wall and um, and do the blast test. We could do it digitally, um, so it's time savings and cost savings. There. Um, here's another example. Um, we're looking at uh, uh, bollards to uh, resist vehicle approach, and the top images are the test. The bottom are the analysis. Um, or the digital twin, and you see they compare very well. And up here is the uh, accelerations comparison. The blue is the FEA, and the red is the average of the test data. And again, this was a uh, a good uh, example of a digital twin where we were able to um, have a validated model that we could use for various situations um, in you know, tweak the model and not have to rerun the test expenses and time-consuming tests over and over again. Um, so in conclusion, um, digital twins uh, can be valuable for design and optimization of physical structural systems um, for extreme load case um, events as we, we showed here. Um, and again, they they can have a cost and time savings over uh, physical prototype testing. Also, effective digital twins do require careful planning um, and collection and implementation of available data to ensure that you know they actually represent the real world, um, because you can um, get results that are not realistic at all. Um, validation of components and properties is key to an effective digital twin um, to ensure that it, it actually represents the real world. So again, we can break it down into different components and validate the components um, and, and not have to try to model or test and validate the entire um, the entire entity or whatever we're trying to use the digital twin for. So with that, I uh, that. That's all I have for today. So with that, I'll turn the time back over to Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Next slide, please. So, um, Robert, you did a great job. And I just want to remind everybody that the concept of digital twins, um, Robert did an exemplary job today for extreme event modeling, but it's also applicable to various other areas of engineering civil, mechanical, etc. cetera. Um, if you haven't already, and we have received a few questions we'll get to momentarily, but I want to remind you to please submit your questions. We have uh, a bit of time, uh, about 15 minutes, that we leave it for Q&A. But before we do that, uh, one reminder on the questions. Please send your questions to both the host and the panelists. Now, uh, as we do always, we'd like to share with you uh, a bit of what's uh, coming forward. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's presentation and you'll join us for future webinars. Uh, as I reminded you last month, we're entering and about a third through or fourth year of ARA Webinar Wednesdays. All of our presenters are ARA scientists or engineers. And on June 29th, the next two that will be up, June 29th we'll be uh, transferring over to pavements uh, we'll be uh, speaking about pavement dynamics, how important is pavement dynamics under different dynamic loading conditions. That'll be presented by Dr. Young Lee. And then on July, we'll be sticking with the pavement theme. July 20th, mechanistic analysis of asphalt running and airfield pavements using viscoelastic shift models. Dr. Gahan 
uh, Jiva will be presenting that. We've got presentations aligned through uh, November of this year, presenters and topics. Next slide, please. Well, let's take a look at what we have in the way of Q&A here. Uh, Robert, we have first question is from Brandon, and his question is, how can a digital twin be used with a prototype? Oh, I think the question, yeah, the, the digital twin um, can be used with a prototype uh, to offer feedback to the product um, as it is developed and, and validated. And it can be used to, to validate a digital twin that can be used to evaluate adjustments to the design. Um, or it can even act as the prototype itself um, to model what could occur uh, with the physical version of when it's, when it's built. So that's a couple of uses there. Okay. Um, nice to see the answer. Very straightforward. So the next question that I have is from Emily. And Emily would like to know, what's the difference between a digital twin and a simulation? Okay. Thanks, Emily. Yeah, uh, digital twins are, are basically just a special type of a, a virtual simulation. It's just kind of a terminology that's, that's evolved over time. Uh, and so it typically represents a specific real-world entity, um, a digital twin does. Um, I guess the most significant difference is uh, the digital twin is driven by real data from, from the real world. Um, and a simulation can be driven by data, you know, generated otherwise, you know, from a computer or other machine. Um, the virtual simulations can produce, you know, unrealistic results that, you know, don't represent the, the real world. So we're, we're using digital twin as, as something, as a term for something that actually represents the real world. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then I'd like to remind people if they have follow-up questions to their inquiries, uh, feel free to send that to Robert. Uh, over the next 24 hours or so, he'll be uh, the most gracious to make his email address available. The next question, Robert, is from Richard. And Richard would like to know, how long does it take to develop and analyze digital twin models like the ones that you discussed today? Okay. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, um, so the, as far as digital twin models, the time will vary, obviously, depending on the complexity of the model. Um, and also, the, as far as analyzing the available computing power. Um, so, for example, the, the cavity wall model uh, was very complex. Um, but it took, you know, it took weeks to actually build that model um, and about a month to, to run the analysis. Um, for the results that we saw there, and that was run on um, 12 computer processors. Um, but this this overall time was mostly just the computer, you know, crunching the numbers. Um, and this amount of time is still um, uh, the savings compared to the the labor and materials, uh, you know, the cost uh, for constructing and actually doing another physical test. Um, so obviously this time could be reduced by increasing computer power to increase that uh, analysis time. Um, other simpler models, you know, can take just hours to, to run and, and develop. So again, it, it varies on the, the purpose and, and the complexity. Okay. Thank you, Robert. And just to remind everybody again, uh, and we've gotten a few more questions, but please send them to both the host and the panelists. That'll help us out a bit. So the next question, Robert, is from Laura. And Laura's question is, uh, which you may not know the answer to, has the Air Force used digital twins as part of the AT slash FP analysis process, which I don't know what the initials stand for. Perhaps you do. Yeah, I am not familiar with that, actually. So, yeah, I... Um I don't know that I can comment. I'm again not familiar with that process. Okay, and and Laura, if you uh, 
if you wouldn't mind, maybe define it a little bit, uh, what ATFP means, and please send that to both the panelists and uh, and the host. Let me let me move on uh, to the next question, which we have, and, and this is a bit of an open-ended question, uh, Robert and uh, Richard would like to know what does the finite element process involve? Okay, yeah, so we, I talked a lot about doing these digital twins in, in finite element modeling, so that's what I'm experienced with. So basically, a, a finite element modeling is you, you're building a, a three-dimensional model. It can be just two-dimensional, um, but a model uh, representing the geometry, and then it's uh, meshed with... Uh, you put a mesh in it, and it's uh, connected by nodes um, to form elements. So it's basically segmented into a bunch of little elements. Um, so you're building the geometry, and then you also have to um, input the uh, data uh, for the material properties um, and uh, the structural properties, you know, related to the stress and, and load vibration levels. Uh, so you know, that's the very basics of it. Um, so it's building the geometry, creating the mesh, um, and also making sure the properties are properly defined um, you know, relative to your analysis program. And that's kind of a lot of what uh, the discussion was today, was making sure that those properties were properly defined um, and validated uh, as we went through uh, you know, the process. Yeah, very good um, overall um, discussion in terms of introducing finite element, what it is, and just for everyone's benefit, not everybody deals with uh, sophisticated analysis, but I'm, I'm a civil engineer. I deal a lot with bridges and landslides and uh, tunnels, and for complex structures in the civil arena, we routinely use finite difference and finite element modeling today. Uh, perhaps two decades ago, that was restricted to really R&D type activities. Laura followed up with her uh, explanation of her abbreviations. So what she was referring to was the anti-terrorism slash force protection, i.e. security assessment per DOD standards. Uh, I don't know if that helps you uh, in terms of an explanation, Robert, to answer Laura's previous question. Yeah, can you uh, repeat the previous question, I guess, so I can... Uh, so, Laura, certainly. Uh, Laura's previous original question was, has the Air Force used digital twins as part of the anti-terrorism force protection uh, program that they use? So, I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with all the Air Force does, but in general, um, uh, we have, uh, you know, the work that I do, we've used digital twin um, modeling yet to uh, to look at that um, anti-terrorism and force protection. We do that quite a bit. So modeling um, yeah, protection from blast loads and um, impact and uh, penetration of various weapons. So we have been in, involved in that. So yes, it's, uh, it's just something that's, that's done and it and again, it's it's a way to um, you know look at the designs and uh, you know, optimize design protection without having to do uh, more expensive testing, uh, you know, or as much testing, um, you know. So yeah, they, I have a, I mean, I think we have I have worked on maybe some with the Air Force, but I've worked on it with others as well for anti-terrorism and force protection. Okay, thank you. I know you did the best that you could with Laura's questions. So that's the last question that we have for today. Next slide, please. Just uh, brief reminders and we'll be ready to move along for the rest of our day. So um, just a reminder with regard to professional development hours, uh, we keep a record of uh, your attendance. If you attended the entire one hour program today, uh, then you'll be entitled to receive a uh, copy of today's presentation, a PDF form, a uh, copy of today's PowerPoint presentation. And then 
uh, that'll be posted uh, at the ARA Webinar Wednesday site early next week. We'll also be sending a PDH certificate to all the participants if you've attended the entire program. So I, I failed to remind everybody also, if you've forgotten, or I've forgotten to tell you in previous sessions, that all of our ARA programs are recorded. If you go to the registration site uh, of ARA Webinar Wednesdays, you'd be able to access the recordings from the previous programs. So next slide, please. And finally, uh, just a commercial, if it's not obvious, ARA is always looking for great people to join our great team. If you're interested in employment opportunities, specifically with ARA's transportation and infrastructure offices, please send a brief resume and your contact information to www.joinara at ara.com. I want to thank you all again for joining today's program. We hope You'll also join us on June 29th for our next webinar. As a reminder, that's Pavement Dynamics. How important is Pavement Dynamics under different dynamic loans by Dr. Young Lee. Have a blessed day. God bless you all.